involved in your feast tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to be speaking for a few moments tonight from the book of John, chapter number 7. We're going to begin with verse number, no, verse number 7. Amen. Praise his wonderful name. What a wonderful time it is to be nearing the return, soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that, oh, it's going to be a one-time event, his return. Yeah. A one-time event. And um, there are many doubters that it's going to happen. Well, it's going to happen. Not when we probably say it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's amazing that, you know, someone's going to be right. If you had a one in 6,000 chance of guessing the, the year that the Lord was going to come, somebody's going to get it. Amen. How much more we're living in the last days that we're living in the last, you know, already 6,000 years have just about passed. So now, you know, there are a lot of people going to be right. So we're praying that we're hoping this is the year. We don't know if it is or not, but we, we, there's a lot of things pointing that his soon return could be this year. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read today from the book of John, chapter number 7. And uh, it looks to me like I have verse number 7 at hand. No, it's verse number 1. I got my glasses on now. All right. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Verse 2. I don't know why this is so ignored so often because it's in the Bible right here in front of our face. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Is that our New Testament there? Yes. Amen. Jesus associating something with the Feast of Tabernacles. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go unto Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, but he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Verse 9. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And then verse number 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Lord, we're thankful today for your presence for allowing us to look into your word and to see your will and the future of mankind. We pray that you would help us as individuals to gain something tonight. From the simplest, Lord, to the brightest, help us to receive something tonight. And someone said, I'm the simplest. Everybody say it. You may not be, I'm the simplest. You may be seated. Amen. From the least to the greatest. It's best to say I'm the least and to say I'm the greatest. Not too many Ali's, say men of this world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to just take a few moments to speak about his presence. His presence. And his presence here, uh, according to these, uh, these verses of Scripture on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, you probably feel it by this time that not very many people are aware of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it doesn't matter if, 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 if it's that God has revealed it. God is revealing it to those that love him and love truth. So we're not the only one. There's many churches that, that love him and love truth. Truth is the utmost important trait that you can have to love the truth. Truth will divide you from many people, from friends, from neighbors, 
Uh, but most of all, they will, you'll realize that truth separates you from, of course, error and the way of error. There's a way of error and the way, there's a way of truth. So if you've developed a love for the truth, or if you don't have, or you don't realize what it is, realize this, that to love the truth, you decide to obey truth. You obey to stand on truth. Truth will take you to places that make you uncomfortable because uh, the world is in darkness. Amen. You will not feel comfortable with the world when you love truth because the world doesn't like the truth. It doesn't like light. It doesn't like good example. It doesn't like a good testimony. It doesn't like any such thing. And this is what makes us different. Not be, and you're not going to find this in the majority. You can run with the world. You can, you can walk with the world. You can do whatever with the world, but it will not. Uh, the world cannot please you, and the world will turn on you when, it, when you least expect it. So love the truth. Amen. You might say, what is truth? Like Pilate said, Jesus is the truth. Amen. And when you have relationship with Jesus, you have truth. Praise the Lord. Now, one of the things in life is, and one of the things about our existence when God created man is that he, from the very beginning, he showed his presence uh, to mankind. He showed himself uh, to Adam in the voice of God. And the Bible says the voice of God walked in the garden, the sound of God. And so that, was, that is what is known as his presence. By his voice, Adam had no doubt who he was walking with when he communed with God. He couldn't see him. He couldn't see any footprints in the sand, but he knew that God was with him. And so he understood the voice. He communed with the voice. And when, and when uh, he transgressed against God, he was... He had a, a, the voice was still there, the presence, but he became broken in, in, his, uh, in his moral ability to, to be walking the way he had walked with God. So God cast him or made sure that he was moved from the garden. And so ever since that time, man has decided that he, they want to get back into the garden someday. Now, his presence was known in the garden. When he left, when they left, then the presence of God was broken from mankind. And so then we realized that God showed himself in his presence with mankind. But the majority of the time when the presence of God came into the midst, he was not recognized. So throughout the Old Testament, you have the presence of God coming and they don't really know his identity and they don't recognize him for who he is. Now, we see when we read these verses, therefore, when we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, it, it has a very important place. It should have an important place in the church world because it is going to recognize, it recognizes his presence. Now, they were going to have a feast, and the festival that they used to keep at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' day Prior to this day, we know this, that the presence of God, they went there to celebrate that one day God's presence would rule the earth. But there was no Ark of the Covenant, and there was no temp, there was no service because there was no Ark. Therefore, they couldn't do the full service of God. They, they knew that, and the presence of God could not visit the temple. There was a temple, but there was no presence. And so they even they had a religious attitude about it. And so for many years, it's not understood how long the ark was gone. But the presence, every year they had waited for the presence of God to show up on a yearly basis. But when Jesus is there, there is no presence showing. There is no ark of the covenant. The high priest couldn't do the service the way it should be done. Because it had been removed and taken away uh, hundreds of years earlier. So they learned to cope without the presence of God. What a, sad, what a sad commentary on the ministry of that day that they were there having ceremony but no presence. It was an empty shell of religion. Many churches find themselves in this situation. They have 
uh, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And what is the power? It has to be the presence. It has to be. Even if God gave one miracle a person per year, it would still be the presence of God. There are many that cry out, well, why aren't all the miracles of God taking place like the book of Acts? If you read the book of Acts and the miracles, there's not a ton of miracles happening every day. But the notable miracles are taking place in the believers. And the notable miracles that take place in the lives of the apostles are, are amazing. So we are still living in this age, uh, and there are still miracles. And no doubt, if you love God in your lifetime, you will experience a great miracle in your life because of the presence of God. You have believed. Now, they are, they are celebrating, but they have no presence about them in the temple. But they do have a presence in the person of Jesus Christ, but they don't recognize it. Now, this happened in Old Testament times. Uh, this happened so many times that we know that when he is, his presence uh, was desired or he did appear, that it was not recognized. Jacob wrestled with him and had to ask him, what's your name? You've been in situations in your life and, and uh, you don't recognize who's the one that saved you from that mishap or, or changed circumstance on your behalf until you, until you start hearing the preacher or you start reading for yourself in the Bible and you realize, listen, if there's been any, adv any advancement and improvement in your life toward God, uh, it is because he's always been there, but you haven't recognized him. But when you start to recognize him, then you find out that uh, Jesus really does love you. Does anyone feel loved here tonight? I feel loved in my life tonight. I love him. I recognize him. Manoah conversed with him and, and wanted to know his name. Moses asked, who should I say sent me? Two of the individuals in the New Testament that walked on the road to Emmaus uh, spake with him face to face and even though he was raised from the dead, they didn't know who he was. A woman came to, came to anoint him and thought he was a gardener. And so it is the recognition. The presence is always somewhere around, but it is the recognition in the individual believer's life that makes a difference in the world. And until you recognize in whom you have believed, the power of God that resides in you or around you cannot affect you. You know, we, we want to feel, we sang the song in his, uh, uh, the, in his presence. We, we, we felt and we realized this, that his presence is like the mountains around Jerusalem. We can sing all the songs uh, in a collective body and we can hear someone else sing about it. But until we recognize him for who he is. Even Paul himself was on a horse. He believed in God on the road to Damascus until the bright light appeared and he fell off. He had an experience, but he didn't recognize who he was dealing with until he dared to ask the questions, Lord, who art thou? I am Jesus. Who is it that has ever given you any good thing in your life? It is Jesus. There's no other term. There's no other name under heaven. There is no other deity. All things by him consist. And nothing without him that is made has been brought forth by any other. 
His presence. Amen. His presence. In the book of Acts, it was stated they, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from any, every one of us. He told these, he told the men that, you know, that if anyone would desire to seek the Lord and that they would put themselves in to feel after him. Notice, to feel after him. You can feel after God. Have you ever been in the presence of evil? You feel it. How much more the presence of God? Amen. How much more the presence of God, which we being evil, according to the presence of God, should feel. Hey, we, are, we are coming up to something that is holy. Uh, surely I have been at the house of God, and I knew it not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because when you, you, when you got God, you can feel evil. Can you imagine how God feels when he is holy and he, and he dares to live in us? How he looks at us and yet he, he says, if they, if they get baptized in my blood, I will dwell in them. I will live in them. I will walk with them. I will talk in them. What's that all about? It is presence. Yeah, he came. To, he, came he, uh, he had the service of the tabernacle. They would come to the tabernacle once a year and want to, have, want to feel the presence of God. And uh, there were times even before that when it was in the wilderness that a cloud would appear and they would feel secure because the presence. Give them warmth in the wintertime and give them shadow over the heat of the day. And they felt confidence because they recognized the presence of God. They were there. Faithfully, they were there loving him. They were there, or should I say better yet, following him. They didn't know exactly who he was, but they recognized this is the one that saved us. After the clouds ceased to be, faith dwindled, and therefore they didn't. Jesus' day, there's not a cloud anymore. There should have been a cloud there all the time. There should have been the power of God, the majesty of God there at all times, but it disappeared into a man. And now this man walks around, and very few realize what's happening. The virgin becomes pregnant with the word. And Joseph realizes that he's had nothing to do with her yet, and he's going to have to figure out, you know, I've been betrayed by this, by this, by this one I, I loved and, and I felt should be my wife until in a dream the Lord tells her, hey, this is of the Holy Ghost. This is the work of God. This is God's doing. And so from that point on, he has great confidence. Mary realizes that what's happened to her is a reality. That God's presence is in her. It was in the heavens. He's in th he's, his throne, he's becoming enthroned in a man. And there he put, he, without a man, he begins to put on the, the molecules and the cells of flesh. Yeah, and he builds himself a body, a perfect body that looks as going to be a future sacrifice. And as it comes time to bring forth, uh, he, the out comes out of the womb. Out of a virgin womb comes a perfect uh, future sacrifice. Uh, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in that baby. Listen, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the center thinking of God had left the throne of heaven, and it was dwelling in this infant child who could not walk, who could not talk, and yet in him was the everlasting father. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And though the world didn't know it, the presence of God was in that baby.
The presence was there, but not even recognized. Men had to come from the Far East to bring gifts. The nation of Israel brought no gifts, but it took wise men to come from the East. And it takes wise men to this day to recognize that there is a king. Not in Bethlehem. He was born there. But there is a soon coming king. And that's why you are in church tonight. You recognize there is a king. He exists. And so even when he walked and collecting disciples... The Bible tells us, if you read carefully, that, that they doubted. They followed, but they had, God was going to demonstrate many miracles through his son. So that they might believe on him through the son. Who's on the inside? The father. Whatever the son doeth, the father does. The father is the spirit. The son is that flesh. But many can't recognize it. Finally, he calms the waves and he says, What manner of man is this? Where even the waves and the wind obey him. Yeah, the president could feel something about this man, but they could not recognize him. Very rarely was someone declared, My Lord and my God. It is an amazing thing. The presence of God. How that, how that the Bible even tells us a few, a few verses after this, or prior to this, in chapter 6, verse 6, 6, after that, after that time, many ceased to follow after him. He lost many disciples. He's not left with very many. When you get to chapter 7, it says his brethren. When you look at that, well, I will have to assume it's talking about Jesus' brothers, Jude. There's a few of them there, but one of them being Jude. James, there's two of them there that somehow are telling him. Everybody, everybody else has left him, the Bible says, basically. His disciples have. He asked him, probably, hey, will you also leave me? But the Bible says his brethren, not his disciples. He says his brethren tell him, hey, show yourself to the world. The Feast of Tabernacles is here. You know everybody's going down there. Go and show yourself to the world, Jesus. They're the only ones that probably could be tempting him, not the disciples. Because they know that he is, he is the firstborn. And they've heard stories about him. They laugh about him in the taverns. And, you know, they make sport of him. They talk about, yeah, they say God. You know, she's pregnant. She, God came forth. He is, he, he daily is mocked. They know about his, they know about his birth. They know, they know about the situation. He's the, they, are, they are part of the, fa- of the neighborhood gossip. But yet, Jesus continues. His own brothers sort of are, are upset about it. They don't know what to think. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They tell him, hey, go share yourself to the world prophetically because he's going to show himself to the world at this particular time. No, he doesn't say show yourself to the Israel. He says go show yourself to the priest. They say go up to, go up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Show yourself to the world. Then the Bible talks about disciples. He told his disciples, his disciples, you go on up. He told him, well, you guys all gone up. He said, I can't go right now. You see, nobody really recognizes who he is. But is not the presence of God there? Yeah. You know, that's how the presence of God works through, through many believers. You're a saint of God. You can pray for people. They might be healed. They might be saved. Things will happen. But it is, you know, it is something for them to, it's hard for them to, really realize when it happens, believe me, they don't, they don't give you credit. They just say, well, they believe, well, it's coincidence. He was getting better. But when they begin to be believers, they look, you know what? Who is this Jesus you prayed, that name that you used to pray over our sick one? When the recognition starts coming and they realize we want to know by what name this is done or why God heard your prayer. But well, we've had all sorts of people praying. It's, it's only, it can only be that God is causing recognition. He was crucified 
People don't know who he is. He is he's resurrected, and very few still believe. They try to cover it up, what they hear happened. They, they try to tell him, hey, someone stole him. You know, he's not God. But he shows himself alive by infallible proofs. And people begin to recognize this. This man that walked among us for three and a half years is God. Not a, not a, a messenger like John or the prophets. God himself robed himself in the flesh and walked among us. He was tabernacled. His presence was in that tabernacle. You see, that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is pointing to. It's pointing to that the tabernacle of God told him, you guys go on ahead. I'll be there. I'll get there when I get there. Isn't that like the Lord? We try to guess, man, hopefully the year, hopefully the year, but hey, he's got it all under control. We're the ones out of control. We're the ones that feel all defeated when it's not the year. You know, we, you know, we feel sad. We feel, I do, for a day or two. But that doesn't make him any less God. And that doesn't make me any less a preacher. And that doesn't make me any less a saint. I just have the problem of believing. It's a good problem. <laughs> That's just my problem. He said it's going to happen. We try it. We believe it's going to happen. We hope that, you know, the time is here. So this is what took place. They waited. They wondered. They hoped. They believed. But yet the Bible said, tells us that there was 500 gathered together one time. By, that, by the end of the 50 days, there's only 120 in the upper room. Jesus goes up and, 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 and uh, is ascended up into heaven. And then the Bible says, some believed, some worshiped, the Bible says, and some doubted. Of the 12 there, there, some worshiped, and some doubted. Listen, I'm not here to condemn you if you still doubt things about God. Because the 12 had that. But if you will only give them the opportunity to, to have faith and to recognize that what he has told you he will do, he will accomplish then you're on your road to success. Yeah. If you can start pushing away doubt with word daily, on a daily basis, not just on a one-time trial, you know, it's not, a, it's not like they'll say it's a seven-day trial and if you don't, I'll get your money back because I'm not going to give you your tithe back or after seven days. So is that a deal, get your money back? No, you either have to commit totally. You have to just, you have to just throw yourself in and you have to believe with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your might. Even though circumstances, uh-uh. You have to recognize that the presence that you feel around you can do it at any given time. And you've got to, you've given him your life. So don't, don't stop believing. Now, Jesus is that tabernacle that shows up in the midst of the feast. He's that tabernacle. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, plural. But he is the source of it all because he is the main tabernacle. God dwelt or God was tabernacled in him. So when he appears, even though that there's nothing in the temple, he appears at the temple teaching and the presence, which is not on the inside, is on the outside of the, of the temple in a man. What an opportunity to realize that, that now is not a box that has to be carried about, but he is a man, and the presence of God, if they recognize it, is on two legs walking around every neighborhood that he can, and people are being healed and touched and delivered, and he is doing the same today. Not in, not in person, but in you, in your person, in your tabernacle. 
Do you think, listen, when he lives in you in the Holy Ghost, you become a tabernacle. You may not realize you become a tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. And just like Jesus had the fullness of the Godhead in him, you don't have the fullness. You have a portion of the Spirit is all. You have a little bit, but you can't handle what he already gave you. You can't. You know, we're not, we're, we're not at that point, but he gives you a measure of it. He gives you a portion of Holy Ghost. That's all you need. All you need is the earnest of the inheritance. That little bit that you feel, that little bit that made you speak in tongues, uh, it's what's going to give you the eternal pleasures of heaven. And uh, can, you might not know this, but it gives you a sense of presence. A sense of presence. Of being someone special. When you're around, listen, if you cultivate it, people are going to feel greatness around you. They're not going to know. They might look uh, at somebody that's not really all together there, but they're going to feel your honesty, and they're going to feel presence. Not yours, his presence. And when they feel that, you're going to get favor in your life. That's what favor is all about. Wise people would do be wise to give you gifts. To say good things to you. To talk good about you when they always just talk evil. Yeah. Because there is something about your witness that causes people to change their minds about you. So that's what the presence, that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is about. It's, it is about presence. And this is the time that the Bible says that Jesus didn't show up at the very beginning, but he went in secret because it was not his time to fulfill the grandeur that one day he will appear there in person. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about, is that it is a celebration of his presence, but not in the spirit and not as a lowly servant, but as the king of the universe and the king of all creation. And in order to do that, he has to come with great grandeur. He has to come with, from the heaven. He has to come from every eye shall see him. There will be no denial of him. There will be no, there will be no uh, guesswork about, about God anymore. This is what is written about him in the very near future. And it's written, it's going to be fulfilled. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. And this is, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform. It's going to be under the law. But nonetheless, Jeremiah said this. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. No more witnessing. No more. There's be no, no sense. There's no need for it anymore. When he returns and the king comes, everyone, where every eye shall see his return. will be affected by it. So he tells us there'll be no more need for a church type situation where I've done great things for you and I'll go and tell people about it. Now this is our time now. But what you and I are awaiting is return. So that that burden will finally be lifted off of us. We are his messengers. We are the tabernacle right now that, ha that should raise our children to tell them about the Lord. We are the one that should, that should live a good example so that people can ask us about God. We are the ones that should speak with our, 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 our speech season with salt. In other words to where it affects people that want to know, makes them thirsty to know about God. And if we learn to do that, we are accomplishing what the presence of God is in us to work for, to work, to reach others. Are you with me? Do you understand? 
Do you, do you follow what, what I'm following today? That we, have, we, are, we are doing this and, and by faith, recognizing a future day. We'll be looking back at that day and say, remember before Jesus came, how we talked about when he came? Man, we're looking at each other. It's happened. Look at what we've done. It was worth it all. God. Aren't you thankful you believed? Aren't you thankful you held on? Aren't you thankful that you stirred it up within yourself? It said, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and to every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Hmm. Why is that? Because Zechariah said, His feet shall stand in that day upon the mount, which is before Jerusalem on the east, the Mount of Olives. Zechariah, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Notice how precious that is. In the future, nobody will have to be, you don't have to witness the way we witness. We witness that the Lord is one. And we witness, we witness that his name. We witness that he shall be one Lord and his name one. There'll be, you and I, people are confused, the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost, and what does the name have to do with it? This is our job to tell them that his name is one and you only need one name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But in that day when he comes, they will know that Jesus came, and we don't have to say a word anymore. There'll be nobody standing next to him or near him, so they'll know that that one Lord that came has to be the Father, has to be the Son, has to be the Holy Ghost. There's only one that is here, and he's Jesus. Stand with me tonight. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King that came, hallelujah, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Should it be important to you? Well, the lessons in it should be very important to you. It is our future. It is our heritage. It is what we've been created as a tabernacle of God for. He, will, he is the main tabernacle. We are the plurality of it, tabernacles. So when the feast takes place in that day, it's going to be about us. The feast of tabernacles. They're going to be celebrating the king and the believers. They're going to be worshiping him and giving honor to those that were glorified and came back with him. It is not about just one. We'll cast our crowns at his feet. We will worship him, but the P everyone will worship him, and they will recognize you and I. Why don't we just enjoy the presence of God for a few moments? I can feel we won't need an altar call today, but if you feel you can come and pray, but right where you're at, if you lift your hearts and thank the Lord that he is imparting to you the gift of knowledge. He is imparting to you the gift of knowledge. Oh, I said he's imparting to you the gift of knowledge. He is giving to you something to, to think on, something to hold on to, something to give you purpose, something to excite you that the king is going to come back. You don't need any worry 
praise. All you need is faith in God. Surely the presence oh, someone right now. Those that are sick in body right now. Lord, you see their tabernacle. You see Brother Royball right now. His tabernacle is in pain. You see how he's in pain right now, Lord, and he is hurt. He is your disciple. Lord, he's a believer. Heal his body and make him whole. If there is a need in your tabernacle right now, in sickness, I'd like for you to come and I'd like to pray for you right now. Oh, he is the deliverer. The presence. He is a deliverer. If you need prayer for your body tonight, bring your tabernacle to the front. The presence. Claim that Holy Ghost power in you. That that power which is in you is going to work in a powerful fashion. Surely the prayer. 